And a fine good morning to you here on Saturday. This is Russ Barkley, back with your ADHD research review for this week. It's a crisp fall morning here in Richmond, and we're celebrating Oktoberfest this week. So I hope you are too, hence the hat. Just a couple of dad jokes to get you started before we go into our four research articles for today. These come to us from today.com. And here's your first dad joke. Did you hear about the archaeologist that got fired? His career is in ruins. You got to love that. Okay, great wordplay. And next up is what's the best way to get to the hospital after breaking your foot? Well, you can see the answer. It's obvious. A tow truck. (laughs) And finally, a dad joke submitted by one of my subscribers, which I thought was pretty good. So I'll pass it along to you. All right. What do you call a Ford Fiesta after you've left your medication in the car? A Ford Focus. Thank you so much. I appreciate that submission as well. All right, let's get started with our research review. First up is a great review of the literature by my friend and colleague Maggie Sibley out at the excuse me, the Seattle Children's Hospital and University of Washington. Maggie and her colleagues did a complete review of the literature on medication and non-medication treatments for teens with ADHD and reported their results over in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. It's a great review. They were able to identify 63 randomized controlled trials of these various interventions, including medication, nutrient supplementation, neurofeedback, occupational therapy, and cognitive and behavioral therapies. And what did they find? They found that medications demonstrated the most consistent and strong impact on ADHD symptoms, but their impact on impairment was somewhat inconsistent. By the way, that makes sense because oftentimes impairment can be related to not just your ADHD, which the medication is likely managing, but situational factors as well. There could be a bad match between the individual and that particular domain of functioning, or there could be other people in that domain that are contributing to impairment in the individual. And of course, medication can't deal with that. But nonetheless, strong impact of medication on ADHD symptoms. They also found that a variety of cognitive, and behavioral treatments for teens with ADHD while producing a less consistent impact on ADHD symptoms had a stronger effect on impairment and on measures of executive functioning. Plus, they found that it produced some moderate benefits on internalizing symptoms like anxiety and depression. So, uh, quite a difference there between the interventions and where they're having their greatest effect, which is why we often say you need to combine medications with evidence-based cognitive and behavioral interventions to address the wide array of not just symptoms, but impairments in ADHD, in this case, in teens. They found that the other interventions that I mentioned did not have sufficiently reliable evidence for their effectiveness to warrant recommendations at this time. No interventions produced significant safety concerns, and they found that at least for CBT, there was long-term maintenance, though there was moderate quality of evidence for maintenance, given that you can't maintain blindness to the treatment conditions once the individuals leave the treatment environment. So that is that follow-up. So a really nice paper there demonstrating what we've sort of already known about child ADHD, but especially adult ADHD, medication produces the strongest effects, and at least for teens, like adults, cognitive and behavioral therapies also produce significant effects, mainly on impairment more than symptoms. Okay, nice paper there. Let's move on and have a look at a paper that comes to us out of Korea. This is a study that's comparing Groups of individuals with autism spectrum disorder, ADHD alone, and the combination of autism with ADHD. And they're looking at the extent to which these disorders affect measures of attention and inhibition. What they're testing here is 
Is there anything that aligns more with one disorder than another? We know that attention is ubiquitous across these disorders. That is inattention, I should say. But the question is, what about inhibition? Earlier research suggested that inhibition tracked more with ADHD than with autism spectrum disorder. So this research paper is going to have a much closer look at that using large samples of individuals with ASD, ADHD, and both disorders, plus a control condition. What did they find? They found that both the ADHD and the combined group were the ones who exhibited the most errors of inhibition. Also, they showed greater perseverative errors as well. Whereas problems with attention, particularly variability of attention, went with both disorders, but tended to be a little worse in the group that had the combination of disorders. So as we said, inattention appears to be a characteristic of both disorders, while inhibitory problems appear to track primarily with ADHD. Very helpful information there when it comes to differential diagnosis and what symptoms are aligning with what disorders. So great paper there out of Frontiers in Psychiatry uh, that comes to us from our Korean colleagues. Next up is a paper on subclinical ADHD and unhealthy lifestyle behaviors. This paper comes out of Italy, and it was published over in the British Journal of Psychiatry, their open journal, uh, and it is looking at a relatively large sample, 440 adolescents over there in Italy, and looking at individuals with ADHD, those who had subclinical ADHD, which means they had higher than normal symptoms, but didn't qualify for a diagnosis, and then, of course, there were those who had clinical ADHD that did meet all criteria for diagnosis. So uh, they found that about 22% of the sample could be called subclinical, okay? About 20% of their sample was clinical, and the rest served as controls. And they were looking at unhealthy lifestyle behaviors, such as in the area of eating, quality of sleep, problematic use of technology, and other factors. So what did they find? They found that the most common unhealthy life behaviors that were used in the groups were energy drinks, along with alcohol consumption, and followed by problematic smartphone use. They found that the subclinical ADHD group also showed several unhealthy lifestyle behaviors, such as altered mindful eating, impaired quality of sleep, problematic technology use as well. They found that both the clinical and the subclinical groups were very similar in the levels of unhealthy lifestyle behaviors compared to their control group. So once again, we see that even if you don't meet full criteria for ADHD, but you have a lot of symptoms and impairment, you resemble the ADHD group. It, it really, I think, serves to illustrate that ADHD falls along a spectrum. It's not a category. <clears throat> and if you're near the threshold for diagnosis, <clears throat> pardon me, and you still have high symptoms and impairment, but not a diagnosis, you are like the diagnosed group. So again, nice illustration of the dimensionality of ADHD there. Sorry about my little cold this morning. <clears throat> Hope it's not interfering too much with the sound quality. All right, last up is going to be an article that I think is very important, provided we respect its limits. It's a very large study out of Norway that is looking at children followed from age 6 to age 14, assessed every two years, and they're looking at degree of ADHD symptoms at each time period, and victimization and bullying at each time period. And they're going to look at the relationships between these two sets of problems over time and development. Very important. So what did the authors find in this very large study of nearly 900 Norwegian children followed over that eight-year period of time? They found that early ADHD symptoms predicted 
current as well as later victimization, but they also showed that victimization at each time point did have an influence on later ADHD symptoms, that is making them somewhat worse. This was especially so for ADHD inattention, but not for the hyperactive impulsive dimension of ADHD, which was quite a surprise. So it looks like these two sets of problems, ADHD and victimization, are affecting each other in a bi-directional way over time, each one increasing the risk of the other. But we see that it's inattention within ADHD that is being most affected by earlier levels of victimization than is hyperactive impulsive symptoms. Now, uh, don't get too excited about this, that victimization causes ADHD. That's not quite what it's saying. They have a re reciprocal relationship. What they point out is keep in mind, there were very few symptoms of ADHD in this population. This is not a study of clinical ADHD. It's a study of typical children. So you have to keep that in mind as well. If we were looking at clinical levels of ADHD, we might see somewhat different results, particularly for that hyperactive impulsive dimension. The other thing I want to point out here is that while the relationships that they found were statistically significant, this is a point I've made earlier, they weren't necessarily all that clinically meaningful because the correlations were very low. For instance, a correlation between early ADHD and later victimization might be around 0.08 or 0.09. That's very small when we think the correlations go up to 1.0. And if you want to know how much variance in a symptom is being accounted for in the relationship, you square the correlation. And when you do that, you're finding that less than 2% of the symptoms of ADHD are affecting degree of victimization and vice versa. The relationship was similar and small between earlier victimization and later ADHD, explaining 2% or less of the later symptoms. So when you use large samples, you can get statistical significance at pretty low levels, but uh, you have to look at the actual data itself. So, uh, okay, everybody, that's it for this morning. Uh, I forgot to turn on my uh, focus filter. So you're picking up a few of my notifications about some of the emails coming in. Not to worry. It looks like they're all ads anyway. No violation of privacy there. Uh, and also just want to thank you again for uh, joining me on this channel this Saturday for this research review and a tip of the hat to October and Oktoberfest here in Richmond. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. So thanks for joining me on the channel. And as usual, live well and be well. Take care, everybody. Bye for now.